Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Pradeep Mal, ambassador of change from Getty. And you are right now on our disruptive education platform provided to us by our mentor, Dr. Sunita Gandhi. And on this platform, we have met with and interacted with more than 1,600 speakers from India and all over the world. And this evening, we have for you Mr. Dan Lanchar, who is again with us. Uh, he's an educator and author. And uh, Mr. Dan Flores, Daniel, he's an award-winning para educator. And uh, they're from Granddaddy's Secrets Incorporated from Mansfield, Connecticut. And uh, Mr. Dan uh, Blanchard, he, as I've said, is an educator and author. Uh, he is a best-selling and award-winning author, speaker, and educator. Two-time junior Olympian wrestler, very versatile person, and two-time junior Olympian coach, and grew up as a student athlete. In fact, he says he was more of an athlete than a student. He now has 14 years of college under his belt, and he has seven degrees. He teaches special education uh, and social studies in Connecticut's largest intercity high school. Here he has chosen uh, uh, by the AFCCT as the face and voice of educational reform and is now on their speaking circuit. He was on their team for their new social studies frameworks. He is a member of the Special Education Advisory Board of the Connecticut State Department of Education. He is a teacher consultant for the University of Connecticut's uh, writing project. He is a double veteran of the Army and Air Force to boot. He, and uh, a play is being written about his very versatile life. Then we have Mr. Dan Flores. He is a former two times para educator of the year in 2014 for Holmes Elementary and in 2016 for the he was a district finalist for the Pulaski Middle School. He currently is a key teacher for the key program at uh, Slade Middle School. He is a former president and a vice president for local 2407 New Britain Federation of uh, para educators and he has participated in some uh, teacher para incidents where conflict resolutions and collaborations were needed to help improve the teacher para professions. They will be speaking to us today on or and to each other on leadership tips and tricks. Welcome both the dance. Thank you, Pradeep. We're happy to be on your show. Same here, Pradeep. All right, so let's see if we figure out how to get this going. All right, um, entire screen. Woo. Okay, what are we doing here? This doesn't seem to be going right. Oh, let me this pop thing. on this one. Yeah, this is the intro right here. Cancel that. Oh, here we go. Right. Pick her up, Dan. How you doing there? Good to see you again. Good morning. Good, good morning, Dan. And, um, Good evening, my folks, or, or, or in India. I know that it probably is around 7.30 to 7.40 or so, and I know that you had a very long day. Our day is, is just starting here. Uh, I just want to give you like a quick disclaimer that the part that the presentation we had here, we had some technical difficulties um, in the morning trying to get the correct one. So this is the one that we have or so. So we will walk you through this. And also, this is more so on a conversation, Dan, right, in terms of, you know, how do teachers, parents, but more so on the uh, on how we can use the second adult in the classroom to be more effective, right, Dan? Absolutely. I think we're going to give a great presentation here tonight for our audience, our Getty audience in India, some great leadership um, skills and strategies of how to best use those two adults in the classroom, the teacher and paraeducator. So, uh, Mr. Flores, why don't you tell our audience a little bit, I know, uh, just real quick about who you are. Um, I know Pradeep just did that, but just real quick. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Dan Flores. Uh, I've been working in education for, for about 14 years now. The first uh, nine years of my time to work as a paraeducator, which is basically like a teacher assistant in a way, from preschool all the way up to high school and a variety of programs, whether they're students who are 
non-disabled, meaning students that have no disabilities and students that have disabilities and a variety of programs, you know, behavior, uh, people that have that live with autism, uh, people who are who are classified as medically fragile, uh, students who, who who don't normally speak English well. I work I, I work with those populations. So so I have a huge um, experience working not only with with different population groups but as well as working with different personalities dan in terms mm -hmm. of you know what you know what are what are the expectations how do they look like in different settings uh with with different administrators with different teachers or so because you know working education i would have bet in anywhere in the world uh, it's one of the toughest things to do because you're dealing with people, you know, you're not dealing with livestock, you're not dealing, you know, with inventory. I wish that was the case, but you know, in, in reality, that's not, that's not, you have to gauge, you know, different people's expectations, you know, different work ethics, different, um, yes, different absolutely. beliefs. So, so Dan Flores is coming at us from the para educators point of view on this presentation. I will be coming at all of you from the teacher's point of view. Uh, in this class, even though we're both teachers right now, uh, Dan came through the ranks as parent educator. Myself as a teacher, I've worked at all different levels from basically kindergarten up to like college, um, adult ed, all that. I've done special education and regular education. So I've been on both sides of the coin on teaching in many, many different kinds of classrooms, sort of like Dan was saying. Uh, it's pretty tricky when you're dealing with people, unfinished products, uh, and, and when you're dealing with a second adult in the classroom, you know, there's always that territorial issues and stuff like that, that we have to uh, deal with and try to successfully overcome to run a successful classroom. So with that said, you know, Dan, you want to share any kind of like thoughts on like, you know, teams or what makes up good teams? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, all, you know, like I'm um, oftentimes we also hear people talk, talking about teams. Well, what does it really mean a team? Because usually the word team, we we, we, we tend to associate that in sports a lot. Or, you know, whether you have a, a team of two, team of five, you know, or, you know, or more. But but the whole function of a team is that you have one or more people that's coming together. Right. To basically to to basically achieve something that they're going after. You know, that's basically sense of this. This is my team, right? This is what we're going to do, you know. And you know, the, the, the interesting about teams, Dan, and th that we actually highlighted in bold and black is that effective teams, you know, whether they're in the business side, whether they're in the athletics, whether like you know, they're like your own posse, like your own friendship that you grew up. This is my team, right? Or academics, you know, too. Right? Or academics, one, one, one of the common, common denominators that we, that we have found is that. Successful teams are built on building relationships, you know, building communication, not 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 like just having communication, but building it. Right. Because that's right there is, is, is the foundation of it. Yeah. Being able to resolve conflict. And that's and, 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 you know, and right there and then, you know, the people that actually form teams or good teams. Sometimes that they don't last as long because of conflict resolution, because mm -hmm. right, because oftentimes yes. you know when there's an issue going on and no one can put their cards on the table and to really analyze mm -hmm. and to see how we can come over it, yeah. that tends to break up the team. The you team, know? absolutely, Dan, you're correct. And you know, so the teams, the communication is essential. You know what I'm saying? And what you said about building the good relationships, the relationships are everything. And it just surprises me, Dan. I know we both have had this conversation many times. How it surprises both of us. How many educators, uh, and I'm going to say, you know, even particularly teachers, sometimes are very territorial. You know what I'm saying? It's like they haven't grasped for some reason, you know, that uh, this is not your your territory. You don't own this classroom. You know what I'm saying? You're sharing this classroom with, like, students. And many times, hopefully, you're sharing that classroom with a second adult if you're lucky. You know what I'm saying? So stop, like, acting territorial. I remember, Dan, we talked about when I was in the Army, you know, and I didn't have one drill sergeant when I was in the Army that was like, multiple drill sergeants when I was in the army and I got some great, great training when I was in the army from having more than one adult overseeing me, guiding me. And I guess maybe sometimes yelling at me, although we try not to do that in the educational world. And it was just, it stuck with me. You know, when the army, I always had more than one drill sergeant or more than one leader, you know, on sports teams, I always had more than one, you know what I'm saying? So why in education, why do they put just one teacher in a classroom with 30 students and say, go to it. 
You know, you're alone, you're outnumbered, you only got one set of eyes, you can't see everything, you're helping one kid, and who knows what the other kid's doing behind your back, you know what I'm saying? So it's just common sense, Dan. We've had this conversation many times, how mm -hmm. two is better than one. So teachers need to stop being territorial and start being grateful to have that second adult in the classroom, that paraeducator, that intern, or whoever, parent, volunteer, or whoever it may be. Be grateful because two is better than one, right, Dan? Absolutely, Dan. And, and also, too, like the uh, whole irony is, like, you know, going back to what you said about teachers being so territorial, the irony is, and I'm assuming my, my uh, folks over at Indian can actually agree to, is that just because you're running a classroom doesn't mean you actually own the classroom. You like you don't like own the building, right? Because you can be moved to a different classroom just based on need. You know that's how it is in other places. If they need you to do the, like the like like um if you work in a restaurant and they need you to work go go work work back in the kitchen, that's what you got to do. You know because you have to be very versatile. And I guess that's one of the benefits for you, Dan. And when you work in the army, I'm assuming that you had multiple jobs that you had to do, and that was just part yeah. of your daily. And you didn't really own like this piece of real estate, even though you were good at it because you had to be versatile. And I guess that's something that most teachers need to understand and realize that, first of all, you should be grateful that you should have someone like um, having um, another adult with you in the classroom because because that's more than one than the average teacher gets. And yeah. second, you know, just because you just because you have a system in place that you know what you're doing in the classroom, you want to run well. Don't get too comfortable knowing that you're going to be there forever because things, you know, because life can throw you like a, a change in, um, in, um, in your path. Yeah. Right? I, guess, I guess maybe I'm one of the outliers or one of the lucky ones, Dan, that I haven't sat in a classroom and, you know, owned it for 25 years. I've had many, many, many different assignments and been in many, many different classrooms mm -hmm. and I've had many, many different uh, uh, second and third adults in the classroom. And sometimes I was the teacher. And sometimes, you know, I was a special ed teacher or sometimes, yep. I was the, uh, sometimes I was on the other side as the regular teacher. Um, I, I guess it just came naturally to me that I've been bounced around so many times and I've been and, and loved it, you know, loved being in different assignments that I never developed that mentality that I've been in this classroom for 20 years and I own this classroom. So I said, teachers, you don't own the classroom, as Dan Flores just said, you can, your assignment can be switched at any time and just be grateful. For that second or down your classroom, no matter who it is or what their experiences are, you know, where they come from, be happy for the help, be grateful. So moving on, <clears throat> I mean, we do know that in today's most, um, you know, effective educational institutions, uh, pretty much what Dan just said, you know, they have great teams that operate on relationships, there's good communications, trust and respect and recognition we haven't like talked about yet, Dan, but um, that's absolutely essential to have that trust, respect, and recognition of the second adult in the classroom. And of course, that goes you know back and forth both ways. Because when we all do that, you know, well, we all win. Isn't that true, Dan? Absolutely, Dan. And and, and also, Dan, you know, just to highlight a couple of things there, you know, we have, we have to talk about relationships. We have to talk about good communication. And, the, and believe it or not, to actually become as part of a team, you guys spend more time together, right? Because if you're not spending time enough, then therefore everything won't, Anything that you do won't mean anything, you know. It is no different if you're if you're part of a team or if you are having um, family time. The way that you bond together is that you have to spend more time together. That's that's how mm -hmm. you form basic relationships. I and totally the irony agree. is too that in education, if you notice, I've been reading reading a lot of art, art articles worldwide, not not just here in the United States, that there's still like huge burnout in terms of you know educators in general, whether teachers, paras uh teacher assistants behavior specialists that are leaving the field due to not having enough um respect for the profession and also the um th th those who are in charge who don't trust their judgment in terms of what what constitutes as as effective practice because oftentimes in education there's too much uh pressure right from from from, from the top to basically this is the these these are the mandates that we need and therefore when there's too much pressure, you know, you're you, the, the, the pressure is not taking into account people's, you know, ideas, people's uh, breaking points, you know, yes, and yes. oftentimes that is where people don't don't feel recognized enough because no matter what you do, 
you know, and, and in one day they expect the, the, the same level or more of it, you know, and that and that really goes to the lack of like recognition. That's what's important mm-hmm. that who, 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 whoever is working with you, whether it's a colleague, whether it's someone on the outside, it's always good to trust their vision. Right. It's always good to respect their values and it's always good to recognize them. You know, and it could be as simple as a thank you. You know, a thank you yeah, goes absolutely. goes a long way. I like it because it's cheap. Mm-hmm. It's free, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's very, no you know, and and, 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 and it all falls back to the good communication and giving very specific praise on why you're saying thank you. Oftentimes, yes. you yeah. know, I, you know, I, I had conversations with Dan and even when creating the PowerPoint, I said, Dan, thank you for your time. I appreciate you for doing, you know, this for me, you know, Absolutely. and he, and he actually it. recognizes that. that and, mm-hmm. I do. I love it when you do that. So I think we all, um, you go the extra mile by saying I appreciate you. Appreciate what you're doing. And I think that educators need that appreciation, that recognition from the administrators. We need to pass it back and forth among the teacher and paraeducator. And of course, remember what we're really there for, not to own that classroom, but we're there for the students. So we need to recognize, give the students some recognition and appreciate them as well. So here comes some thoughts on teams. All right. Um, Jen, I think we'll just go through this real quick and just sure. kind of talk about thoughts on teams and some of the most famous people out there. Uh, looks like the Oprah one's a little hard to see, so we can paraphrase that. But we're going to break it down into the academic world um, speech, okay, lingual. So let me hit the first one from Vince Lombardi, the old great Green Bay Packers uh, football coach. You know, I always loved how he said a great famous quote from him. Talks about how he said fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. Love that in a sports thing. But it's also in the educational world and the working together world. You know, saying how we got to freaking hang in there and don't let that fatigue get get the best of us right but this is what he says for this particular slide and on, on vince Lombardi's thoughts on teams he says the individual commitment to a group effort that is what makes a team work a company work a society work and civilization work so to break that down you know what i'm saying when he talks about an individual commitment to a group effort you know that's what makes a team work so dan we've discussed this many times that team is me and you you know, that's the teacher and the paraeducator. We need to be committed to that group effort, not just that I, I, I. You know, I do this, I do that, right? So, and when we work, you know, the, the Vince Lombardi says the company can work, which in educational lingo is the classroom, right? And then when the company or the classroom is working, society can work, you know, which we make that into lingual, educational lingual of the schools working, right? And when society's working, the school's working, Vince Lombardi says the civilization works. And we say that that is the neighborhood, the community that is housing the school, that's surrounding there. So that's the educational lingo. Vince Lombardi obviously knew what he was doing. And I think that we can obviously borrow from outside experts and real winners like Vince Lombardi on commitments to group efforts, making the school, the team, you know, the school, the classroom, the school, and the community working. So next we got Henry Ford, another uh, expert, famous expert out there that I love. Uh, Dan, you want to mention him real quick? Absolutely, good folks. If, if you guys don't know, if, if the keyword is Ford, so have you ever heard of the American Ford car? That's where it comes from because he was the one that actually invented the uh, Ford um, automobile. You know, at least here in the United States. And you know what he said was that coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress working together is success and that right there um re- resonates to me because you know if, we, if, because if, if we're taking this phrase and put it into the um educational language you know dan coming together seems to me that that is like um beginning of the year you know we're all here in the beginning you know keeping together to progress i'm saying that that's probably like the halfway point you know once you're done with your midterms or you're moving on to the uh, next semester you know and then working mm-hmm. together is success. That folks is just the end. Of the, that that folks is the school years over. You know, we actually made it, and we actually made it work. Or so, so it's a pro. It's a process. And you know, with, with, with schooling and, and and the schedule, that process never changes. It never. It, it's always the same yeah. schedule: fall mm-hmm. to winter. You know, yep. spring to uh, but, summer, and so on. There so is so a lot of fatigue in there, Dan. Like the newness wears off. A lot of mm-hmm. fatigue comes in with the routines and the longevity of the school year. I mean, it's a hard job and it's a long school year. Heck, it's a long day and sometimes even a long class. So I think that you're right, Dan, with Henry Ford about this whole staying together. You know, saying there's a lot of stamina that we can't let fatigue get the best of us, as Vince Lombardi was saying. And moving forward to the Oprah Winfrey one, uh, you know, I hope everybody can see this one all right. 
but she talks about how a lot of people want to ride in the limo but what she wants is that someone that will stick with her right when the limo breaks down and dad every single school year every single class even there's a lot of places where the limo can break down oh, you know? every yeah. single exchange all right right there's a lot of places where that limo can break down and uh you know we, we want people that are going to be with us right dan even when the limo breaks down mm -hmm. absolutely man don't be like flicking out on me when things get like kind of hard or like kind of um, inconvenient you know because I, again things happen right just like just like anywhere else you know and that and, and, and also, Dan, where it says here, but you want, but, 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 but what you want is someone who will take the bus with you when the limo breaks down. And that right there goes back to keeping together's progress. You know, that right there just, 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 you know, goes back to, you know, why building relationship is so important because, you know, you have, because you have to establish those relationships for two things, you know, one, establish your, establish your relationships with students. So that way, you know, your students' tendencies, their strengths and weaknesses are. And second, you want to establish right away your relationships with your staff with those who you're working with you know whether the, whether they're in your classroom or not because that right there is your uh, um support team you know mm, yes with the, well, yeah, when, again, absolutely no room for i i i right mm -mm. two's better than one and i would say dan i think you would def definitely agree with me is that if you get these experts these real winners like vince lombardi henry ford oprah winfrey giving their thoughts on teams I mean, I think we should seriously consider in the educational world, you know, what they're saying and how to apply it in the educational world, because obviously, you know, we're a team, teams work way better than the I, I, I. So moving on, Dan, I think that there's, these are some of the traditional roles of the paraeducator, you know, let's say on the left and the teacher responsibilities on the right. But you and I have had a lot of fun discussions on this particular topic, how uh, the, the old paradigm is not necessarily true today. Can you walk us through, Dan, the fair educator? You know, all the stuff you do. And uh, and then maybe uh, I'll, I'll jump in real quick and talk about how the old paradigm is not necessarily true today or maybe the best way to go. You know what's interesting, Dan, that, that like I'm noticing here where it says pair educator in blue and teach, teach responsibilities in black seems to me that like I tend to do more of both roles than like just my role itself. I don't know about you, but oh, I absolutely. also help with planning programming. You know, I also assign the final grades when when you're not there. You know, I'm yes. also the one that sometimes I have to make con formal contact with parents when, you know, no one's there to actually do that, whether it's a phone call or uh, whether it's in-person meetings or so. Mm -hmm. I think that, like, aside from, you know, doing all the data collection, all of the monitoring for the, all the uh, supervision of the kids, I think I think that I kind of do, you know, a little bit of both, which I think I'm also, like, underpaid as well. What are you <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. And I fully agree with you. So again, the old paradigm is breaking down and the old paradigm. I'm not going to say that it's broken. I think maybe we're fixing it. You know what I'm saying? But the old paradigm of the fair educator, such as in you, Mr. Flores, you know, um, you know, assisting with behavior, monitoring the playgrounds, lunchrooms, observing, recording information on student performance, right? And the facilitating of the inclusion. I mean, I'm doing a little bit of that too now as the teacher. And, and rightfully, I should. And the stuff on the right, you know, which was traditionally, let's say, the teacher's role, you just shared with us how you've kind of jumped into that pond a little bit and you're helping. And again, I think that's great. I don't think the old model is broken. I think we have the new improved paradigm of um, teamwork, you know, saying the groups and leadership, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, why, why shouldn't you, as the parent educator, jump in? and help me design and implement and evaluate instruction. I mean, you've got a, a myriad of expertise and experience yourself. So, uh, you know, just because you're the peer educator doesn't mean you don't have that. You do have that. So it just makes sense for you to jump in my pond and play in my sandbox or pond as well. Because again, teamwork, you know what I'm saying? Two is better than one. Mm -hmm. And that old model of this is my classroom this is what i do this is my territory as the teacher you know the general who's running this classroom i think is 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 outdated no doubt about it dan so Absolutely. i'm going to do both of you all of these things we both do so let's slide over to our next yes. slide so how do you see yourself as a supervisor well i gotta say uh again i'm, I'm kind of looking at the old model here you know, do I see myself as in charge? 
You know what I'm saying? And the parent educator is my subordinate. Um, no, I don't see that. You know what I'm saying? I think the new paradigm is that we don't see it that way as educators. You know, as teachers, I don't see um, my parent educator as my subordinate. But Dan, you've been in many classrooms and you were president of the parent teachers union where you kind of spent time with parent educators that maybe didn't see it the way I see it, correct? Absolutely, yeah. Because the uh, my, because the uh, mind shift the, the, during that time when, when when I was leading the workforce over two hundred was that from like their perspective, from the pair perspective, is, is that they have to basically uh, please their uh, teachers as much as they can, so that way that that, that their ratings go up. That's the why that, that's the reason why that, that mindset was uh, was enabled because I, because quite frankly and quite sadly those parents didn't really trust their teachers to basically do the right thing, you know, on their own. So therefore, oftentimes the teacher assistants, they would uh, tend to do more than their share just to make sure that everything was kosher. Right. And also to make sure that their rating scales didn't, um, didn't take the hit or so, which kind of fed more into the mindset of, Oh, this is my teacher. This is my supervisor. This is what I got to do to please my supervisors. Whereas my supervisor just, valuing me for my value for what it is you know mm, yes so i think that old uh you know being the subordinate i think is outdated it is and, uh, and all, all about that how much authority do i think my parent educator should have or do i do i see or recognize the range of skills and assets my parent educator has and i would say absolutely but i know like you know in the early years i didn't really know how to work with a parent educator so i just taught the class and the parent educators were almost like another student in the class for me. And I and I know that I'm so glad I don't do that anymore. You know what I'm saying? But Dan, I mean, what do you see in that realm? Do you see that teachers uh, really, you know, evaluating the assets of the paraeducators and giving the paraeducators authority that they, uh, that they maybe need to help our students get the best education? I Actually, I do, you know, and this right here actually um, ties back to uh, um, what we talked about, which was relationships, you know, and here's why. You know, depending on which assignment you're working in in education, a teacher, a classroom teacher, whether it's a regular teacher or or, or or special needs teacher or so on and so forth, they may be assigned a paraeducator to them in, in in their classroom because because of the needs of the students. And one of the things I I, I found, and, and I'm sure Dan can actually agree with me, whether you're working in a behavior program, whether you're working with students who are intellectually um, low cognitive and you know and, and in their academics, or students who just need like extra push. Anytime when teachers are assigned a second adult in the classroom with them, then the mindset kind of shifts because they're spending more time with each other. And therefore, the mindset of this is my subordinate goes away. Right. Because now because now they're, they're spending more time together and now they're seeing the value of the pair educator and then vice versa, too. Right. Because usually mm -hmm. that mindset of me, me versus you. Um, um, naturally occurs when, when when people don't spend enough time and then therefore they're only there just to do the job. What do you need? Okay, so I have, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're really spending more time collectively in a group, you know, and you're working towards the same common goal, then those pre-notions of me versus you goes away. And now you're starting to gel more together because you spend more time. And therefore I have literally seen people pair us um, saying that I value your time teacher and vice versa because now they're seeing, you know, who this person really is or so. So yes. I believe that that model has to really increase more so because sadly, oftentimes, you know, if you're if you're a regular classroom teacher and you're in charge of 20 to 25 students at a time and it's just you, then yeah, it makes sense why why why, that, why you will become more territorial and start questioning other people's, you know, abilities, whether whether or not they're like good um, antenna is because those folks who work, who work in isolations, didn't have enough opportunity to work with other adults, you know, towards a common goal. Yeah. It's more so based on, okay, here I am. With, tell me, um, tell me what you need to do, and then I'm out out of like 20 minutes, and then I move on to the next yes. one. So yes, and I'm, I'm glad that it's definitely happening more. And we know it's not happening everywhere, and it's not happening often enough. I mean, I can see. I mean, going back, you know, when I was the regular education teacher in the classroom, you know, especially in my early years, like I didn't even know sometimes how to best use. The special education teacher in the classroom, you know, not like the paraprofessionals or paraeducators, like I'd already previously mentioned. And there have been times when I was on the other point of that, when I was on the, um, I was the special education teacher in the classroom, and the regular education teacher in the classroom didn't best know how to use me. 
So I had to like speak up sometimes and say, listen, why don't we do this? Let's do that. You know what I'm saying? And I think paraeducators in some cases are doing that more, speaking up for themselves, saying, why don't we do this? Let's do that. And I think maybe a little bit more teachers are being, okay, yeah, yeah, definitely valuing them, you know, their experiences, uh, valuing them as an asset, but there are still teachers that have been in a classroom for like 20, 25, 30 years that have been running the show alone. And then a pair of educators shows up in the classroom. They don't know what to do. They're really uncomfortable. You know, and they have the old paradigm where they're the general running the, you know, running the war. And uh, it's, it's just, I like it that things are changing, but I think need, things need to change more and maybe change faster. So let's move on here to relationships. So Dan, you early, you mentioned earlier, you know, what is um, trust? So I want to throw this at you. You know, you said that we need trust to have a, a good, efficient classroom to give the students the best possible education. Do you remember that time when we were running a, um, uh, a seminar, a presentation for the American Federation of Teachers, and we asked the teachers to, uh, that were in the audience to come mm -hmm. up with a trust fall? Do you remember what happened with that? Yes, I did. Many yeah. audience didn't want to do it, and then the, and and then therefore we 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 told them, well, yeah, it makes sense because you haven't spent enough time with each other. Okay, again, trust is developed based on how much time you're spending with each other. That's how it works. Yes, and 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 then after spending much more time, uh, you know, with, with with the other educators, you know, they were much more willing to like let's say do a trust fall. You know, what I'm saying because like you said that they um spent a lot more time with us getting to know us and getting to trust us, even to the point where they put their physical safety into our hands and we did not disappoint them. Of course, we caught them, right? So it comes down to, you know, um, in that classroom, you know, do you trust your colleague, right, in that classroom? Um, you have to. You have to learn that trust your colleague in that classroom. A lot of it comes down to time, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that very soon. But, Dan, something about evaluation. You know, let's say you're my paraeducator and it's my job to do a, like a written evaluation of your job performance. That could get a little tricky if their trust isn't there. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I remember th there were numerous times where I had to go into big time meetings, you know, with, with the principal, uh, with, with the para that I was representing and also with the classroom teacher to basically talk about um, the poor um, job performance that was written to them. You know, and then and then and then one of the things that always boils down is part of the reason why the people receive poor poor evaluations is is more so on the lack of trust that the teacher had on the parent to basically do the job that they were hired to do, and the lack of trust that the that the parent had on the teacher because if I do it my way, then therefore I'm going to get uh, like a low rating because I know that I, I have I have found an easier way to do so. But my teacher doesn't trust me to to do that. Therefore, I'm stuck to do whatever my teacher tells me to do. You know, so that's why that, that that's what you see there when it comes to the evaluation in terms of job performance. Because oftentimes, if you're working in an environment that the, the that the teacher wants X, Y, and Z and want it all the time, very strict or so, um, that teacher is going to set, is going to set is going to set them up for a failure. And I'm seeing that now. You know, I, I there's one classroom um, in my building. That the teacher is very strict and she wants very strict protocols and everything's on a strict schedule and then therefore she's not she's not uh, building the trust to to the way that the uh paras can uh, go to her and confine her and then it's creating this uh animosity in the classroom where the culture climate is really festering is very um hard right and then therefore um you know they they you know and 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 they want to leave that's what's important that you have to give and take you have to work with the person you, know, you have to be able to trust um not 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 yourself as a teacher but trust the uh people that you're working with that they can carry the job it may look differently and it's okay to look differently just as long as the objective is achieved and therefore you you as a teacher dan that helps you to grow better because therefore you're you're um, activating your growth mindset and that you're and you're further expanding your skills as on how to work with multiple people at different abilities, different work ethics, right? Different perspectives. And then therefore you have more of a range to basically evaluate your classroom in terms of, in terms of how it's running, you know? And that to me is a very effective teacher who's able to trust your paras or, or, the, or the adult, their vision, you know? To basically ask them, what does trust mean to yes. you? How, how, 
Yeah. How can yeah. I, the teacher, yeah. you know, win your trust? Yes. And I think that when it comes to vision, the teacher may have a vision and the paraeducator could have a maybe a similar vision, but it's also a separate vision. So if you get this trust going, you know, build that relationship, uh, have that two-way communication going back and forth, then I think that sometimes your visions may may uh, they may change a little bit, but they may mend together and become two visions is better than one vision, right? So you compromise, you come together somewhere, right, with a, maybe a stronger vision because now you've got like that synergy of multiple visions yes. coming together. And any teacher that doesn't respect, let's say, the, uh, the experience of the um, paraeducator I think it's really missing the boat. You know, some some teachers come in and say, well, I'm the one with the masters. You know, I'm the one with the two masters or whatever it is. You know, say, yes, that's nice. And that brings a vision in itself. But so does a lot of life experience, which a lot of their educators bring in. Oh, and by the way, you know, not only should that not be discounted, but Dan, I know for a fact that there's a lot of pair educators out there that are working on their masters or have the masters like you had when you were a pair educator. That's what I did too. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, it's totally funny that I just brought that up because um, during my time as a pair, I actually wanted to um, become a teacher. So and one of the things that made me a very effective teacher that I am now is basically I basically learn all the all the goods of the positives of a teacher and basically learn from other folks who did kind of wrong to parents or think things that are just not good and i learned mm -hmm. and, and i learned to avoid that right i learned not to do those things and to basically keep improving myself and then during that time i went back to school and got you know i got my bachelor's and master's in uh, education or so but yeah. i was very fortunate for me to work with a, with a whole variety of people that basically helped me mold me to the person that i am um today yeah. You know, so that way that, you know, when I'm working with with new folks, whether they're seasoned in, in, in the education field or brand new, you know, I treat everyone the same. And I basically tell them, OK, so what are your expectations? You know, what is your vision? What do you want to get out of this so that way I can help you to move on to, um, to the next level yeah. and vice versa? Yeah. too. So, Dan, it sounds like schools would be very wise to bring up their paraeducators through the system because they could make the best teachers. And there's got to be a trust there within the school system to trust the, the paraeducator workforce and help them and encourage them to come up with the ranks and be the teachers, especially with the teacher shortage that's going on in the great tsunami that's common. So again, it comes down to trust. Okay, so we have some more activities here that helps build that trust, that relationship and that communication, you know what I'm saying? And I think that one thing we don't do enough is um, PD activities that actually build uh, like relationships, you know, team building. I think we need more of that in school. And Dan, I think we need more of it out of school, which I hope you can address in a second, because it's also pretty a pretty good idea for uh, the adults in the classroom to see each other in different roles of, let's just say, outside of school, where it's not necessarily the teacher and parent educator, but now two grown adults outside the school. Want to talk about that real quick? Can Absolutely. Absolutely, too, because you know what, though, um, it makes sense. You know, if you're building something, then you want to keep doing it over and over again. You know, one of the analogies that like um, me and Dan have always talked about and, and one of the advantages that um, teams have, you know, in, in terms of, of athletics, you know, whether you start as high as low as high school and going to college and, and, and the professionals is that they're constantly spending more time with each other. Isn't that kind of crazy, Dan, how like they spend more time planning they spend more time traveling mm. they spend more time in the hotel they spend more time, yeah. more you know, time with each together. other and then they go live for no more than an hour two hours the most in the live game and then they leave the live game and then they come back spending more time with each other doing actual activity to basically build yeah. that trust level yeah. whereas in, whereas in education you know we go live for seven hours and we're always constantly scrambling to have planned time with each other and sometimes we mm. can't get it because there's because there's not enough time so let and, me jump in right there there i love how you yep. said not enough time and that's kind of where we are so there's never enough time inside the school building so i especially with all that data crunching going on and the lack of relationship building that is going on in the school building so when we get outside the school building if me and you go to like a ropes course or like a Red Sox game or a Yankees game. Let's say the vice principal gets a bus, brings a whole bunch of the teachers, educators, paraeducators, counselors, you know, whoever, bring all the educators that can go to like, let's say a Yankees baseball game up here in the Northeast. And that's because that's where we are in the U.S. Um, I see you completely different. I start seeing you, Dan, as like an, 
a, a, a human being, as another adult, as a responsible father, you know, as a, as a man with a lot of experience out there in the, in the world, rather than just my paraeducator. Wouldn't you agree with that? I agree. I agree like a hundred percent of that, you know, which is something also that we need to do that more often, you mm. know, like whole scale. Yes. So oh. it comes down to, are we spending enough time together? We need to spend more time together, both inside and outside of school. All right. And, you know, and that, that's just going to help communication, which is the exchange, obviously, of ideas, feelings, right? It's not just data crunching. All right. And the funny thing about communication, Dan, right? And the, the I guess the biggest problem with communication is that we often have like this illusion, don't we? The communication has been accomplished inside the classroom. But if we go to a baseball game, we might see something like this, correct? Or sports, yeah. A disagreement or so, and therefore you're out of here, you know, get out of my face. <laughs> yeah. Right. And sometimes in the classroom, you know, there may be, there may be differing opinions in the classroom where we're like, you're out of here. And we want to throw them out. And then maybe the illusion that communication is going on. But sometimes it's not. And it's boiling. Right? And it's about to erupt when we're not communicating and not working effectively as a team. Right? Communication then, also, Dan, too, it's also ongoing. It's never, like, stopping. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if you're not, like, um, um, communicating with each other, then and therefore, of course, that that image with the uh, 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 in, in baseball with the umpire is something that get out of here. It's going to happen. You know? It's going to happen. There's going to be conflict. You know, we're going to have different information, different points of views. We have different processes, different values, and different styles. And we somehow got to figure out how to put that together through communication. Or what do you think, Dan? What happens? Or um, you're going to have like a huge uh, um, volcano ready to erupt. You know, it's going to happen, you know. And um, I'm assuming that this probably has happened to you and your own, like, um, in your own personal life, folks, that if you don't, you know, address the issue, if you don't even have, like, open communication, you know, with your family or your friends, what was once like a small problem just fester, fester into something large, much larger, and it becomes much more difficult to uh, deal with or so. That's the reason why that you want to keep, you know, working on it because it because it's a life skill, you know, for everyone to have, not, you know. Yep. Otherwise, nah. the molehill has become mountains, right, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And we, we want to tell the problems are small. <laughs> no doubt about it. So, Dan, how do we deal with the problem when it's small? Absolutely. When it's small, the first things, folks, is that you want to attack the problem because that's what it is. Because I, because at the end of the day, chances are you actually like that person, but the thing is, is that you don't like the action that that person did. So, so it's really it's, it's really the issue at hand. And not so much with the person, you know, you want to, you want to stay on point. You want to stay on top in terms of what can we, what can be done and don't say what cannot, you know, always, always think of what we can do and not can't always encourage, you know, the different points of view, because at the end of the day, we live in a very rich world, Dan, and sometimes different points of view can help, um, solve the issue at hand because maybe the they're coming in from a different angle that you didn't thought about it all. That, that 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 you know, and that that happens to me all the time with with, with Dan Blanchard. Where every time I go have a meeting with him, I give him something, and he's oh no, have you have you ever thought about thought about thought about it this was like oh yeah, you're right. I didn't. Mm. You're actually right. I, I, and I'm always catching myself doing that with him, like every single time, yeah. different points of view, you know. Yeah. So Dan, it sounds like everything you're talking about right now, and everything on this slide goes back to everything we've been talking about. You yeah. know, building that can building that relationship, the communication, the trust, right? So, you know, what you just said, don't attack, you know, don't attack the person, attack the problem, right? Understand from their point of view, obviously show them respect and build that relationship. I mean, again, relationships are everything, you know, especially in the uh, academic or educational institutions, an environment where, you know, a million things can go wrong and that limo could break down in a million ways. So uh, in closing, Dan, I think that uh, if, if we just... Remember that we're not products. The students are not products. It's not all about data collections. It's all about relationships, right? And about having a little bit of fun from time to time. Uh, I think we can make a big, big difference, don't you? Yes, we can. And we can um, not only make it, but also make change for everyone, you know? Because the thing is that if you and I, Dan, come together, if everybody in, 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 in the education come together, then therefore, 
our end result is provide a better service for our students who in turn they themselves become better no doubt and then with a performance like that with us you know on the same page performance like that we can bring down the house and have a little bit of fun too right mm -hmm. <laughs> and i guess we're going to be closing up with pretty much saying that's all folks so folks much time to go home and then can you tell them about the special offer that we have for all of the getty audience members absolutely folks so right here th th this right here is a, a picture of our book that we have it's on it's on amazon which is a conversation education how teaching pair educators can work can work together and to, to become better or so and on the link you're going to see a hyperlink in blue which is a conversation on uh, on education and that link uh it's going to if you click on the link it, it takes you to amazon.com and we're going to offer a free book uh to, to to you guys as our gift to you for being very good members for um supporting us and all and this is our way of saying thank you to you so you have a free copy um of our book yeah so we just scratched the iceberg today with our presentation on this and um if you go this this is a rich resource for you so click on the link go to our amazon page and the ebook we'll be waiting for you to click on to get your free copy of the ebook all right and i'd say dan i'm pretty much wrapping this up uh this was a pretty great conversation pretty good time here for uh with getty and I think that we're going to have Pradeep coming back on to close this out. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Uh, we could see in your relationship the trust, the respect, the gratitude, uh, the relationship, of course, by itself, and diverse points of view being accommodated. And I think that is what we were talking about this evening. And uh, uh, another thing I would like to just uh, suggest is that a person should compete with himself and not with anybody else. It's an I versus I situation, and that is something that we should foster. And maybe that will uh, cut down a lot of hostility uh, amongst people. What do you think about that? I, I love that idea, Pradeep, of competing with yourself and not the other, right? The, the other is a teammate, right? Not, not in a, a competitor or an ad, 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 adversarial uh, opponent. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can always improve, right? If you're if you're constantly competing in, um, against yourself, right? Your numbers can't go anywhere but up if you're doing that. You know. Uh, no, I disagree. <laughs> in terms of your growth, in terms of your growth, in terms of your growth, not not yeah. in terms of you trying to True. better improve yourself. True. I mean, you're not uh, basically limited to yourself. You're limited to your environment. Yeah. And it's up to you to make that environment big. And you yes. get more and more ideas from that. So uh, make a better self of yourself in, in every field. Uh, anyway, but that's something to chew on. And thank you so much for that leadership tips and uh, tricks talk uh, discussion from both of you. And good evening, everybody. Goodbye. Uh, see you again tomorrow. Thank you so much, Dan and Dan. Thank you, Pradeep. Thank good you. night from here. Good morning to you. Yeah.